Hi everyone. Um, let's see if we can do this in 20 minutes or less. I'm trying to make these a little bit faster for you. So today we're going to be looking at um, the innovation of early 20th um, century architecture. This is our last unit, our last section um, before a quiz. Um, I will lay out um, our, my plan for next week um, through Canvas for you, but we will take some sort of formative quiz. I don't think I can give you a summative quiz. Um, online yet. Uh, we might have to do that later, um, but as of right now, that's been the directive um, that we shouldn't um, give you anything summative. So if other teachers are, make sure you contact their um, instructional coordinators. So let's go ahead and get going. Um, what you're going to see first is um, we're going to be looking in our own neighborhood. Um, we're going to be looking at Chicago. And so I wanted to see if you guys knew why Chicago was such an important city in the rise of modern architecture in the U.S. as well as the rest of the world. So does anyone know? Looking for hands. Just kidding. The reason for that is the Great Chicago Fire. So the fire um, really decimated most of the, or not most of the city, but a major part of the city. Here in this map, um, you can see that most of the loop area, the downtown area, um, where people lived is where, where as well as a lot of buildings were, um, were basically floored. And so it left a blank canvas for architects, construction workers, immigrants to come into the city and really rebuild and transform the city. Um, probably one of the first structures built after um, the Great Fire um, was this um, department store called Marshall Fields. Um, Marshall Fields was Macy's. Um, they bought them out a few years back, um, it, or Macy's built out, built, bought out Marshall's, I should say. And um, you'll notice that after the fire, modern architecture really wasn't all that modern. It was once again based on historyism. And so looking at this structure, what historical styles do you think it was based on? Um, you might say it looks a lot like Roman art history, right? With rounded arches. Um, here with the aqueducts, we even see the masonry. You can see how rustificated this is. You might think of some of those uh, piazzas um, in uh, Florence, like the Palazzo Medici or Riccardi thinking about how they looked very Roman-like. You might even think about how solid it feels like Romanesque architecture. It's very blocky, it's very massive. Um, and so this was really common. You know, we saw that in neoclassical and romantic architecture as well, looking back at the past and just recording it. So you might notice that we start to transform and we start to see architecture moving away from the sense of historyism. Richardson in Chicago built this department store, and then to compare, we have the Carson Peary Scott building by Louis Sullivan on the right. What are the major differences in style? Richardson on the left is very much based on historyism. It's very much based on symmetrical design. It's based on historical past things that people understand and know. And Sullivan was very much inspired by the new materials at his disposal, as well as new, like kind of clean, pristine design. So Sullivan um, is has several buildings in the Midwest. He was really um, out of Chicago, but he did buildings um, in the industrial centers of the world. Um, or of the United States, I should say. And so this is in St. Louis, and this is one of his earlier buildings, and it's in a style that we see over and over again in his work. And he used this tripartite design, which basically means his designs are based on threes. So how does the structure seem to be divided into three sections? You might notice that the bottom, and this is going to be similar for the Carson Peary Scott building as well, so feel free to write it in. The bottom is basically like this, the, the 
the public facade of the building. This is maybe is going to house some stores in it, um, maybe the two stories of a store or two. You notice they have large windows, a large opening into the structure. You might also notice that it's not symmetrical. What we have here is two windows on the left and three windows on the right. Then we have this large projecting cornice. Then we have a series of office spaces, right? And so we have a lot of similar spaces all the way up. And then at the very top story in this attic structure, we might have ventilation, the air system, that sort of thing, nestled under a projecting cornice. So he's not just, you know, creating all new details and designs. A lot of this was based on historyism. So thinking about projecting cornices from Roman design or um, Renaissance design, like those palaces in Florence that I mentioned. So here's a close up. You can see that it's got a lot of ornamental um, style to it. He was very inspired by Art Nouveau, which was common in the day. It's a decorative detail based on organic materials. If you remember on our field trip, we saw that metro station in Grant Park that was donated by the city of Florence. It was based on vegetation. That's um, very common um, of Art Nouveau style. And so you can see that it's underneath the windows as well. This is in Buffalo, New York. So similar, divided into three, right? And you can even see it almost has like artificial official buttresses. So very sort of Romanesque in nature, right? But that leads us to our Carson Peary Scott building. And so um, we're gonna break this one down a little bit. We actually have two images for it. So what, thinking about its context, why was it made and why is it important? Um, we could first start about just why it was made. Um, so it was made to be a department store and to house office structures. Um, so after the fire, um, the Carson, um, I think it was the Carson's first, um, paid for Sullivan to build a very large flagship um, for their department stores in the city. And um, it takes up almost the whole city block. It's a very sort of large structure. Um, it's made of some new revolutionary materials. And so it's made out of steel. It has an inner steel structure that's done in a grid sort of pattern, which is like most modern sites, sort of skyscrapers today. It's covered in white terracotta. Um, so terracotta and masonry would be much better than anything like wood. It has large windows and it also has bronze. So the materials of it allow for it to be taller and stronger and to allow people to be able to look inside to see um, the merchandise, but the people in the offices also had really great views of the city. So looking at how is it modern, um, you might notice that it's very clean and pristine. Um, it's not um, from standing back ornamental. Um, the materials are very, very um, smooth and refined, and it's not based on symmetrical design. Right. Um, Sullivan coined a phrase called form follows function. And so this is a term that you should associate. Make sure you write it down with Sullivan. And what this basically means is this is a, the, an architect motto um, that he coined that basically says you should design it based on the need of the building. So knowing that it was going to be a department store, he designed it to have a doorway that led into a pretty open sort of space and you could reconfigure this any sort of way that you wanted and so it allowed for flexibility also thinking about those large windows letting in the light but also letting people to see inside that's going to make people want to go inside and spend money and so structures needed to be built based on their function and their need this is a pretty modernist thought most of the time buildings were built um, for the whim of the patron, they might be built um, to um, show power, um, but here it's being built in order to meet the needs of the people and to adapt with those needs. 
So let's see if we can find the tripartite design. How is it divided into three? The bottom section has the area of business. I think the first four stories, if I remember right, were actually the department story. Then we have our middle section, which is the office spaces. And then we have the attic story and the cornice at the very top. And so you'll notice how the design changes on each of these sections. What do you think the focal point is? Where's the emphasis on the structure? It has a beautiful entrance, right? And you'll notice that that entrance is underneath a curved area. This structure isn't all curves, right? It really is just on the corner. And so that becomes like a focal point to allow our eye to kind of notice that curved element. And so the entrance is covered in this bronze Art Nouveau style. It's almost like these vines are like covering the surface. And so it really draws you in with its beauty. It's a close up for you guys. You can see how thick it feels. Um, it like feels like it's in like really um, taking over the structure of the of it. And so this would be a popular style with the people um, of the day. And so it makes sense, you know, you know, to tantalize the people with this really beautiful sort of visual elements to get them inside your structure. Right. Um, this is a really badly pixelated um, image, but you can really see how large the windows are so that you can see the merchandise. You can see here, too, that today it's a target. Um, so I'll use that as an example when we talk more about the interior space. Um, but it's a target. Carson Perry Scott went out of business probably two or three years ago. And so um, now it's a, now it's a target. Um, we used to see it on our walking tour. Um, I just learned that um, this uh, school of the Art Institute, or not the school, but the Art Institute uh, suspended all field trips um, through pretty much the end of April. So as of right now, I still would like to go on our field trip if we're able, but we probably won't be able to go on the art, go to the museum. But normally we go on a walking tour and I take you to this building. So let's talk about Target, right? So when you walk into a department store or a major big box store, normally think about how it's laid out. It's laid out to appeal to your senses, but also to help you want to buy more stuff, right? So let's go to the diagram that's on the right here. We're going to walk into the building and then right there in front of us, just like at Target today, you're going to find things that are on sale or that are seasonal. So like last week when I went into Target, there was a bunch of stuff for St. Patty's Day there. There's a bunch of Irish stuff, um, things for food, things for decorations, um, and so and things to celebrate with. And so this had the flexibility with these small columns to allow for them to rearrange their merchandise, as well as to kind of set up um, cosmetic counters and jewelry counters and so on. And they had the flexibility with the rest of the space to adapt and to change it based on the needs of the season and the merchandise that they needed to sell. So once again, form follows function. The st Here's an example of the middle view, um, section with those big, large windows really was appealing to people who had office space that they could see the beauty of the city of Chicago. Even when this was built, um, the city was considered to be a very beautiful place to live and work. But then you might also notice um, that even though it looks very modern, it does still have some characteristics that are based on historyism, as that projecting corners at the top but also has a lot of ornamental and decorative elements to it. Even in the areas that are clean and pristine, if you look really close, there's gonna be some ornamental decoration. So lots of Art Nouveau, decoration in between. So we have like mosaic work with that terracotta design. The next architect that we're gonna look at is Frank Lloyd Wright. And so if you remember our field trip in the fall, we went to Roby House in Hyde Park. Um, you might notice that it 
or you might remember that it's kind of built on a ship. There's like a prow, the front of a ship over here, and there's this long sort of longitudinal sort of element to the structure. Um, he, his structures were pretty revolutionary for the day. Um, he has a garage that is connected to this. Um, most of us have garages that are connected to our houses today, but most houses during this time had separate structures for your garage. And so this was pretty revolutionary. His style is really known for the as the prairie school. Um, he would include the house or the building and nestle it into its natural environment. He'd do this by using a lot of horizontal slabs so that it kind of was flat and, and kind of conformed to the natural surroundings, kind of like inserted into it. So you can see um, that you actually see a lot of the masonry and not a lot of the structure when you're on the ground here. It gave it kind of a secluded feel. You could kind of look out and enjoy nature, but there is also a sense of privacy. Um, this is um, at the University of Chicago um, or in the neighborhood. And so that university had already existed, um, but it also wouldn't have been as nearly as built up. And so there would have been um, prairies outside of here, or at least some fields for them to see, but then also gave them privacy from people walking by. So you might notice that it is based on three stories. Um, the first two stories are really centralized based on a staircase and a fireplace. And you see the same staircase on the third story. The very bottom was kind of like the play area. It had the garage and the driveway, but then also had a playroom for the children and billiards for the adults. The main living space was on the second story and the fireplace divided a living as well as a dining. And you notice those elements that make it look like a ship on the edges here. Um, this is the entertaining floor. And then the private floor where the bedrooms were, were at the very top. So Franklin Wright was known for a lot of innovation in this time. When we look at falling waters, we'll be able to identify even more, but he was kind of a control freak. Um, he designed all of the structure as well as the furniture that you see, the built-in furniture. You notice this dining, um, like hutch area, um, armoire to keep, like, keep the, um, the dishes is kind of built into the wall. You know, all of those would have been sec separate pieces of furniture before his day. Um, he designed the stained glass windows, the light fixtures that you see built in. Um, he invented skylights, or at least was one of the first people to use skylights to let, let natural light into the structures. He even designed a gown for Mrs. Roby to wear when she was in this dining room and in the living space um, hosting her guests. The Robies only lived in this house for about four years. Um, he, Frank Lloyd Wright liked to use revolutionary materials. And so underneath these windows was some masonry, but also he used a lot of plywood. And plywood was brand new in the day. And so he was really interested in using it to build structure as well as build furniture. And of course, when I think about plywood, I think about cheap, cheapness. And it didn't really stand the test of time. Um, the Robies lived in the house, like I said, four years because it was so cold in the winter, they couldn't get the house above 40. So you can imagine how uncomfortable it was to live in this space at times. Here's the billiard rooms at the bottom. So that leads us to Falling Waters by Frank Lloyd Wright. And so this is the one in the 250. Um, a little bit of context. Um, this is for in southwestern Pennsylvania. It too was made for another department store mogul, um, the Kaufmans. And so um, we have Edgar Kaufman Jr. and his family. Um, and so they would go to this area every summer um, as recreation area. They'd go camp and stay there. And so they wanted to build a home on their favorite sort of water hole. So we're gonna watch this video and see how the architecture interacts with the natural environment. Maybe. Let me get this. 
playing first. My Screencastify stuff is in the way. Now we go. So we're looking for how it is integrated in the natural environment. Sorry, it's a little fuzzy. So notice how it's kind of built over the water. Kind of built into the hillside. Notice the rocks are integrated into it. Notice it jets out over the natural environment. Look at those windows really allows for you to be able to look outside and to see the water, enjoy the scenery, hear the sounds of nature. You'd hear that babbling brook. You'd hear the birds. You see the trees rustle. I'll try to attach this video for you as well so that you can maybe watch it a little bit clearer. I'll see if I can find a better version. My old version, the link didn't work. I think we're getting ready to go inside if I remember right. Okay, so notice how the stairway is right in the water so you can like jump in if you went down that staircase. So big open spaces, big patios, big windows, so you can really enjoy the natural setting. You might notice some inspiration by Japanese architecture. He loved Japanese architecture, and so he studied um, a lot of those um, Japanese structures that we looked at. Okay, so how is it in the natural environment? Um, supposedly he designed this structure on a um, drive from Milwaukee to Taliesin. Um, he's kind of procrastinating on it, didn't know what he wanted to do, and he scribbled this pretty, this pretty elaborate drawing in the time um, he designed you know, this for the Kaufmans. Um, he used, once again, a lot of innovative materials for the construction. Um, he used ferro concrete. So that's gonna be reinforced concrete. If you've ever seen an interstate or freeway built, um, you probably have noticed how they often will put metal into it before they pour um, the surface, like the concrete or the asphalt. He also used cantilever design, all those horizontal and vertical elements that kind of jut out, or I should say perpendicular elements. So the things that kind of like, you know, change directions, they're in polar opposites. A lot of um, cantilever, with cantilever, we don't have any vertical structures that come down from it. It's all internal structure that allows it to look like it's suspended into the air. And so you see that here, all of this would have reinforced concrete here um, as well, it lets you really integrate it into that natural environment, right? You could walk down these stairs and jump into the creek and enjoy it, the waterfall that the structure is built on top of. So the interior space has a lot of innovative elements that were really invented or utilized by Frank Lloyd Wright. 
um, and became really popular after this. So besides the attached garage, he also had things like skylights to let light in, large windows, um, an open floor plan that was inspired by a lot of the Japanese architecture that we saw, right? Once again, remember to embrace the exterior. He used local rock um, for the construction of the interior as well as the exterior. Notice those large boulders in the fireplace. The last piece that we have it was done at the end of his career, and that's the Guggenheim Museum. This is across from Central Park and really close to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. Um, is this similar to his earlier designs? It does have a lot of undulating surfaces to them, kind of projecting from each other, but much more based on curvilinear rather than rectilinear elements. Um, it said that he was inspired, but also worked with a man who did a lot of carports. So that circular design, the idea of like kind of spiraling up the structure could have been influenced by that. He wasn't actually the first choice for this structure, but I'm glad he was, right? Um, do you think this later work blends into the environment like his earlier pieces? Not really, right? Um, he was very much obsessed with those circular structures. Um, and circular elements. Notice how even the uh, sidewalk has circle patterns into, in, into them, right? Here's the interior space, um, has a nice atrium on the inside. I would say that a lot of art museums are designed in a, fim a similar style today, where they're based on curvilinear elements. We'll compare some later um, art museums as well um, that were based on historyism, like our art institute was is that way. But it has a very central sort of um, space, and then it has a spiral ramp design that kind of leads you up the structure. So you can see how the different floors are connected by this image. Right now, according to Wright. Um, one should experience the structure in a different way than it normally is. So when you go to the Guggenheim, normally you start on the, the bottom story and you kind of meander and walk up the structure. But Frank Lloyd Wright thought it would be a much better experience to go into the structure, ride an elevator all the way up, and then to slowly walk down. I mean, I think it would be much more enjoyable to walk down a ramp than up a ramp so that you could take your time looking at the different art exhibits. Um, also, you might notice here the big, beautiful skylight at the very top, letting in a lot of really beautiful natural lighting. You even can see that in some of these floors here. Um, that's the best way to view artwork is natural light rather than artificial. All right. So I will get you more information on how we're going to take a quiz later. Um, but for review, you might want to make sure that you know your different artists and their style. Um, obviously, know architecture and new architectural terms. Um, know the connection with history, writers, thinkers of the day, as well as leaders. Um, know the function of painting and sculpture and architecture. Know the history of science, of, of photography, the science of it, as well as the art. And keep in mind that we will do some sort of um, review uh, formative quiz um, that will go all the way back to Rococo. So you really want to make sure that you know the characteristics of it. Um, keep in mind that this presentation is posted on Canvas for you to kind of go back and review. Um, we're going to have neoclassicism and romanticism. We'll have um, our rest in peace. So we'll have our realism, impressionism, and post-impressionism. And then we'll have um, some of that modernist sort of thought. Okay, I'm going to stop there today.